Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to this East End Libraries event hosted by the West Hampton Free Library and numerous other East End libraries. And thank you for joining us for this special inside look at the Academy Awards with author and film critic, Molly Haskell. Over to you, Molly. Thank you, Carol, and hello, everyone. Um, I'd really like to do this, not as a lecture and just me talking, but as a conversation. When Nola Thacker first approached me to do this, I wrote down the date, March something, and I, I was sure it was after the Oscars. So I thought, that's great. We can have a sort of postmortem and discuss what we think of the choices. But of course, it's before the Oscars, and I'm not a predictor. I hate predicting, but um, I think there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about. But please jump in at any point. I think the idea is you're on mute and then just unmute because I, I really do want it to be a conversation. Um, well, one of the craziest things is, is there's a kind of inverse ratio now between how many people write about the Oscars and how many actually watch them. I think tons and tons of people are writing about it and blogging about it. And as each year, the audience for the Oscars dwindles and dwindles and they keep desperately trying to, to, to do things to, to increase the audience. So I mean, that's one of the sort of comical things. Apparently, there are people who have blogs that just write about the Oscars all year long. And then um, I, um, I think it was Saturday Night Live did a funny parody of it in which they had a host and asking these three film experts about the films that they'd seen of the year. And it turned out they basically hadn't seen anything. So it's like there's just so much. I mean, the sheer quantity, I mean, leaving out streaming and all of that, all the you know various things on television, just films themselves. Um, when I came of age as a film critic in the 60s and early 70s, it was a much different world. If I don't know if any of you go back that far, but <clears throat> um, it was just, there was just fewer films. First of all, there were newspapers, critics were, were sort of establishing themselves in, uh, and there was a whole movement to sort of take American film seriously, to treat cinema seriously, and there were critical disputes, and people all across the country, people were more or less seeing the same films, and foreign films was mostly European films. I mean, there was an occasional Satyajit Rai Indian film, but basically it was European, and the past, there wasn't that much of it, <laughs> all this decades and decades of it. Um, so, now I think there are more critics and more movies than ever, more critics than ever, but it's just so much more diffuse. There's, there's sort of no common ground. Um, there are different demographics and different films, you know, that, I mean, things like uh, sort of superhero movies would never have been in the running. They wouldn't have been, I mean, the whole, I guess the criteria, that was, that's what we sort of have to ask now. What are the criteria now? I mean, it's interesting to look at, you may have read about the Sight and, Sight and Sound is a British magazine, and they do a 10 best poll, of 10 best films of all time poll every 10 years. And recently the Times published like 10 different decades. And what was amazing is how most of the same films were on it decade after decade, the great Renoir, Ford, Orson Welles, um, I think there was there would be one or two silent films. Now there's hardly any silent films. I think there was one this year, but only one. So it just it just there's sort of no common denominator, and that's that can be that you know it's sort of a good thing and a bad thing. It's one. It's certainly more diverse now. Certainly, I mean the Asian cinema is just exploded, and just trying to keep up with the names. I have a little list here. I can't I can't be expected to remember to print how to pronounce some of these names, but. This is just a wonderful kind of enrichment of cinema by all these different cinemas and by genres that, as I say, didn't used to get any respect. So now you have a, a thing where, I mean, something like Maverick or, um, you know, superhero movie would never have been considered for best actor, for best film award in years past. And so it's a real sort of mishmash of, of different types of film. Um, I mean, I was just thinking this year, for instance, so I see it, I go to the New York Film Festival, so I see a lot of films there. And it used to be that, say, the films at the festival would be reviewed in the Times and everybody more or less in New York would, you know, it's a funny when I think of that, everybody, what I think of is everybody, which is a funny thing in itself, because I think one of my favorite films, which is very divisive, is Tar. 
And it's sort of making fun in its first scene. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but the first scene is Kate Blanchett being interviewed by Adam Gopnik at one of these New Yorker festivals. And I think the tone is sort of uncertain and you realize it's satire that, 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 that this audience who's in the know like us is being satirized and she's being satirized for her sort of self mythologizing and he's fawning. Anyway, it was this, is this kind of elite audience and there's no elite anymore. Um, but so that was what we, um, when we were review, so we would go to the New York Film Festival and the Times would review it and everybody would read the Times and everybody would see these films. Well, now I see films at the festival that my sort of non-cinephile, non-film buff friends never see. And they're reviewed in the Times and they probably don't even, maybe don't even read the reviews. So there are a few films that sort of everybody's talking about, but then there's this whole, I saw about five films at the festival that I don't think anyone be except for maybe real hardcore film buffs and film critics saw and then there are these other films that I don't necessarily see I haven't seen Avatar yet I don't know if I will um so there and the superhero movies I'm not I'm not about to see nothing is gonna and that that's one thing about not being a you know film critic on hire I don't have to write about those things I just heard by the way that A.O. Scott has left um, and is going to be reviewing left film and is going to be doing books at the times now. So I don't know what that means, but it's, it's interesting little footnote for all this. So, so you have, anyway, you have these esoteric films, like somewhat esoteric, Saint Omer, um, Joanna Hogg's Eternal Daughter. Um, well, After Sun actually got tr some traction, which is interesting. The Scottish film by Charlotte Wells, um, has has fared pretty well on some test best lists, which I wouldn't have. I liked it when I saw it, but I'm sort of surprised at just how how many people have talked about it or responded to it. And the actor in it, Mescal, apparently is sort of hot now because he's playing Stanley Kowalski in uh, Streetcar Named Desire and the, on the stage in London. But um, then the uh, then the art film that's that, that's sort of the one that when I mean, we've lost a lot in New York, we've lost a lot of of art theaters, of course, the Lincoln Plaza two years ago. Um, and then with COVID, so people aren't, especially older people, just aren't going out to movies. And there's some movies that really need, I think of this year's movies that need to be seen. Tar is one, I think, that needs to be seen in a theater. I saw um, um, The Fablemans in a theater, which which I'm, I'm glad I did. I did not see everything everywhere all at once in a theater, which I'm sorry about. I think that's one and from everything I've heard from people that did see it in the theater, it just sort of envelops you. I think when you're watching it at home, you get a little antsy and it seems, you know, one more, one more too tumultuous scene to too many. But I think the thing about everything, everywhere all at once, which is, I think we can sort of safely predict at this point that that's probably going to win since every single, every single awards group has get placed it first. Um, but, but it's been a surprise. I mean, that's, been a little bit of a surprise that that's happened because it is it's not any it's not an art film it's a it's this lowly I mean it, I think it started with something like Crouching a Tiger Hidden Dragon when sort of the Kung Fu movie became a, a really art house spectacle and, and a, it, it went, went from something that was kind of a B action genre to be, becoming a respectable full-fledged artistic film so everything everyone all at once of course bows to that and the great Michelle Yeoh who is the star of this was the star of that and is I mean what's great about it is it's this middle-aged woman who's had a rough life with this laundromat in her house she just doesn't appreciate her husband anymore and just dragged down in debt and then she suddenly shifts into this multiverse where all of the possibilities of her life sort of open up and I mean, that's sort of an incredible thing. I'm, I'm, you know, an action film with a middle-aged woman of the star who's who's maybe going to get the Best Actress Award. Uh, I think it's probably between her and Kate Blanchett. But I, I don't, as I say, I don't want to make any predictions. Um, so I think I, I think I can see now how that, I think it, there really is kind of something for everyone there, which is not the case of a lot of other films that are on the, um, that are nominated um, we can. I, I'd love to get. I'd love to hear what you've seen and what you've thought of films. I did have one other thought this year, which sort of interested me, which was that, and, and you're not ever supposed to make um, generalities about gender, but I did notice a difference in films directed by women and by men this year. 
Uh, first of all, there are a lot more films directed by women now. So we're getting a chance to see, compare women among themselves and not just as these sort of unique specimens like um, like sort of we've had in the, in the past, a Jane Campion, say, or others. Um, so I've seen these, but Saint-Omer by um, this wonderful Senate, French Senegalese director, uh, Joanna Hogg's The Eternal Daughter, uh, After Sun. There's a film called Showing Up, which hadn't opened yet, but with M Michelle Williams. It's a Kelly Reichardt film, and she's she's it's, it's this kind of artist colony up in uh, New England. And it's all of these films are so reticent. Their beginnings are so with the so withholding of information. There's no exposition. They gradually, and after Sun, you don't quite know where you are and what's going on. And that's the same with Saint Omer. You're in, you're in Africa one minute, and then you're in this French courtroom. And the, the Eternal Daughter, you're in the dark, and it's this sort of spooky. Is it a ghost story or is it really happening? Um, so that I mean, this can be good and bad. I mean, the, the, I think it could be um, a sort of a deficit if women can't do. I think you do need to have something that drives you forward. And if I mean, you can have Kind of vagueness and unresolvedness if it's deliberate at a certain point but there's also a kind of they're very heavy on atmosphere whereas the male films this year and i think part of this may be sort of going amplifying everything because because it's not because they don't want to be as opposed to streaming as opposed to the small screen so you've got these sort of um uh grandiose Everything at once, everything every, well, all at once, and very noisy and over the top. White noise is one. Um, Bardo, I don't know if you, uh, any of you have seen that. Avatar, Amsterdam, um, uh, Nope. They all are, are, there's a kind of too muchness in them. So I thought this was interesting, a sort of contrast between sort of male and female films this year. So um, come in now and if you've seen anything, I'd love to hear responses. And if I've seen it, we'll. We'll discuss it or argue about it or the, anything about the Oscars in general. Any any thoughts? Anyone there? <laughs> Is anyone? I don't Hi. Know. Hi. Um, when you're talking about uh, the Oscars and saying what you were saying, I'm wondering, I don't follow it nearly like you do at all, but I'm wondering, is it also about just commercialism that it's it's a question you know why do these action movies are happening and why is is it because it's so artistic and so creative or is it also just there's such a commercial element well i think it's it's both i think there was a thing i was going to read it was sort of interesting um somebody was writing about the berlin film festival which just ended if i can just find it uh, oh yeah so it 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 said in Berlin, in, Ber in Berlin, the critics praised organizers for balancing a focus on global events with artistic ambition and glitz. So, I mean, that's sort of everything rolled into one. I think diversity, I mean, in the older days, f film, it was an art. We were dealing with art when we were making 10 best lists. Film is art. Now, I don't think, I mean, it's like even then, the, the, the trend against hierarchy has been ongoing mm -hmm. it, it was even then in the 60s and 70s we were reassessing sort of older movies mm -hmm. westerns that had been considered the b movies and and elevating them now everything is sort of a movie uh there's no genre so lowly that it can't be given the full dress treatment so part of it i think is is a kind of natural impulse toward diversity towards inclusiveness as opposed to right. exclusiveness you know right yeah so um yeah go ahead so so it's both i think it's a little bit of everything so that, that's what they're trying they want to get more people watching and one way of doing it is by spreading right the the honors i mean they've always done that a little bit they've always wanted to um spread it out to to, to give lesser uh known know. things having a, a chance like I mean, one of the examples this year, which is kind of <sighs> crazy, is that so, the, the campaign to get High Leslie. I don't know if you followed that at all. No. This film called High, uh, High Leslie. It's uh, um, Angela, uh, what's her name? Riseborough, Andrea Riseborough. 
is a British actress that nobody sort of, I mean, she's apparently quite good. I, I, I wasn't familiar with her. And it's this little film, little independent film in which she plays it. She's very good, but she plays a, a really raging drunk and she's brutalized. She's freeloading off people and she's awful to her son. And I mean, you know, she's going to have redemption at the end. So you sort of put up with it, but it's just non, this nonstop thing. And I think one reason that struck me that all these these Hollywood stars like Kate Blanchett and um, um, Gwen, Gwyneth Paltrow and others thought this was so great because they wouldn't be caught dead in a role like this where you don't have any eye makeup and you know you just yeah. look yeah. grungy and, and sordid. So, I mean, that's a real f- feat of acting for them. Um, I mean, not that it's not a good film. It's just sort of odd to be on there. And there, there was sort of controversy about, was it sort of cheating the way that it got on or not? I don't think it really makes that much difference. But yeah, I think they're trying to do a balancing act mm-hmm. of art and commerce. And as they say, and, and high-mindedness, don't forget that Hollywood has always been big on sort of socially conscious films, that so, the kinds of films that maybe critics weren't all that interested, but that had some sort of political aspect so all of these things I think feed into it I mean Parasite two years ago won and that was a sort of surprise that Korean film about that had a kind of political you know yeah. rich context yeah I saw one of the movies I saw the Banshees of Venice yeah I didn't care for the movie at all you didn't. You didn't. Well, that's it. Was, a, it was know, very it was, sad, extremely yeah. sad. Yeah. And it just, I've been to Ireland five times. I know a lot of Irish people. My son in law is from Ireland. Yeah. It was a very sad movie. Yeah. And I think in this day and age, the last thing we need is really sad movies. <laughs> well, it's true. We could use a little uplift. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's but, interesting. People, that's another one that people are divided about. I'm my feeling, and I'm sort of divided in that I thought the first half was very dark but funny, and then it just lost me. I think when he starts cutting off his fingers. Oh, you know, my God. Uh, that was the beginning of the end. So grotesque that somebody who loves m- play music would never do that. And it becomes sort of a parable about Ireland, I think, about Ireland sort of cutting off its nose to spite its face. Um, yeah, I agree. And some people have criticized McDonough because he really didn't grow up in Ireland. Is not getting it right. I, I wouldn't be able to speak to that. I did think, I especially like, I mean, I think Colin Farrell's probably going to win, but I especially like the supporting players in that. Yes. Kelly Condon and Keo. Keo, I thought was terrific as the young boy. So yeah. yes. And the yeah. girl was very good. And the she girl was, was terrific. Good. Kelly Condon was terrific. So I mean, yeah. to have to work with something, that story. Yeah. A story like that where it was nothing but depressing, except for the very end when she leaves and says, "You know, yeah, more I, like, I know. I'm out of here." <laughs> yeah. You know, it took a woman to say, "That's it, I'm done," and she left. You know, <laughs> yeah. But there was nothing left for that man. It was so sad. Yeah, it was. It was. It was like a. I, I really don't find. I don't want to take over your Zoom. Go ahead. No, I want you to. No, please, please. I mean, it's I really- haven't seen any of the other movies, so I really can't compare. But getting tired of a lot of movies that are nothing but about murder and evil and witches. And, and it's just, you know. You know, this is what young people want now. It's horrifying. No, I don't think so, because I have 21 grandchildren. Wow. And what? none of my grandchildren even go to the movies. They watch they watch the Avatar movie. Uh-huh. And um, they don't even really go to the movies. What do they watch? Their phone. <laughs> they don't watch a lot of, uh, some PBS shows. Thank God. Uh-huh. Um, we don't. We just. I know a lot of people my age. I mean, I'm old, so I, you know. I'm only well, I know. I, I think there is a generational thing going on and not just old versus young, but even just segments of the. I mean, who's going to see um, what's the one of the male stripper one? I mean, that's. Oh. 30, 30 or Big Mighty old. Mike or something like that. I mean. yeah, yeah, Magic Mike the third. Um, yeah. yeah, they're little groups, but I do think, um, I want to say something, I, I'll share your feelings, but the horror film is a huge genre now and somebody's going to it because it's what a lot, a lot, a lot of, and I don't, I never loved horror film. The only ones that I like. Yes, horror are, films, yes. Yeah, they're everywhere now. Um, I'm surprised they're not any on the on the Academy list, but Every once in a while, there'll be one that's sort of anchored in a reality. But I've also found as I've gotten older that I have less tolerance 
for anguish of any kind. I don't know whether it's my nerves or what, but even reason, I just don't want, I don't want lure. I don't want bloody. I don't want, I don't want sort of junk. Junk. I don't want, <laughs> what? Junk. But, yeah. I don't want junk, but, um, but these are the genres now that, um, that are a lot of people are, are, are making and watching. And I sort of try to keep up, but there's a, lot, there's a lot of stuff that I just draw the line. I mean, for instance, I'm sure all question on all quiet on the Western front is well made. I watched about 10 minutes of it. It's beautiful, but it was just so violent right from the outset. I said, no, I just can't. And it's on the list. It's up. It's one of the 10 nominees. So, and I think it did win in Britain or someplace. Um, so I maybe have to watch yeah, it. Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of history involved in that movie. Yeah. And I don't think too many 20-year-olds or even 30-year-olds know that probably their grandfathers were involved in that or near, you know, whatever else was going on. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Yeah. I, I don't my kids know. asked me if I was alive during the Civil War once. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> oh, all that passed, all that passed, yeah. So any other thoughts? Well, you um, mentioned that political... I actually, mm -hmm. um, the 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 Banshee movie reminded me kind of a like Dead and the Broadway play, The Beauty Queen of um, Lenane. Yes. And the um, All Quiet on the Western Front. I thought it was the musical score that made that movie. Oh, really? That that um, the drum beat of uh -huh. something going. It was just. I think that really put it over the top. Yeah. And, um, well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you told me that I'll definitely watch it now. I it's, mean, I think really, I should. You know, the story is not, there's not that much character development. It's so. Um, it's been done before. There's another one about 40 years old. It's the same. Right. Book. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that one also, I think, won the same award in Britain as the, the new one. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so, but the hard thing I found with the Academy Awards is there's so many best picture. It, the category is like seven movies or Ten. more than that. Ten. And so trying to see all of them and then judge them all, I, 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 I still haven't gotten to um, three of them. Um, well, you do it. They're I haven't all done much on DVD at least. So. The one I haven't seen yet that I, I, Avatar, I don't care about. Maybe I'll see it. Maybe I won't. The one I did mean to see it somehow I haven't is Women Talking. Um, which is, uh, the, the, yeah. So that's, a, has anybody seen that? No, it's, it's coming in DVD though. I, I have it. Really I long. know. Well, I have this ridiculous little thing that I do that. I refuse to pay $9.99 for us to stream something. <laughs> when it, I have to wait till it comes down to $3.99. <laughs> well, so, it's at, actually, you can request it on the library web shop site, um, the DVD, Interlibrary Loan. That's the way I did it. Oh, really? Yeah. I do that. Yeah, I do that. Yeah. Well, it's not on Hoopla, though. No, no. You have, yeah, you have yeah, to get yeah. the DVD. Um, oh, well. Oh, yeah, I can't do streaming. that because I'm in town now, so I'll do that in the summer. <laughs> oh, God. I can't wait to get back out there so and <laughs> get all those DVDs. But they were all all of the ones that I saw that uh, um, I didn't see the Avatar one or the um, there's the one independent very small that nobody saw. Okay, um, here's the list. Let's see, I've got it right here. If I can read it, all right. We did all well uh, on the Western Front. Avatar, The Banshees of Industry. Oh, Elvis! I was amazed that that got on. That was a good movie. Oh. Well, I thought the beginning was, was was just everything but the kitchen sink, but it got to me. It did get to me at the end. And I, w I was a big Elvis person. He was really important in my life. So, so yeah, but so many people did not like it. And mm. I didn't, I mean, he was good, but I don't know. I was a little surprised that it, it's gotten so much. But also Top Gun is on. So it's the and same kind of thing. Both of them are I supposed to be good. entertainment. That's what they are. They're entertainment. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. But that's the kind of film that probably wouldn't have gotten on like ten years ago, because it was it, it was such a thing as something being too commercial, you know, too too fun. So, um, 
or I don't good. I don't agree with you there though. I really don't. I mean, I think that there have been like wonderful feel good movies in the past. That's what I was thinking of Tom Cruise. He did it as a prequel or a sequel because he was in um I think it was a color of money was the the sequel to cool well, him to um I just think there was, those are all better film. The color of money and rain man and all of those are really good dramatic yeah. films. But, well, yeah, I mean, to me, I guess a lot of people did like I mean, to me, I, I remember when I read the critics and they, they were all praising, they said, oh, it's sort of, you know, he's come of age now. He's acknowledging that he's older and wiser and all of this. And so I see this thing and they're going on this suicide mission. That's the most dangerous fl flying mission anyone's ever gone on. And not a single person gets killed. And then they come back and all the men are hugging each other. I, I just thought this is what we used to call a male weepy when it's <laughs> being emotional. You know, they were always making fun of women for having these, you know, weepy melodramas, but men can do it just as well. As <laughs> it, just as well. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I know I a guess lot of people you, really responded, men and women really liked it. So I don't no, know. I mean, the prior Academy Awards, didn't they, they were always used to be some fluff. And people would say, what were they thinking when they nominated? Not every oh, sure. nominated was an art no, film. You're right. they, they were fluff. No, they, so were. I, you know, they were. They were that, or they were things that I, I didn't, I was so busy trying to get my head around everything for this year. I just didn't go back a long time in time just to see, but no. And there also, what's interesting is how many of the ones that do, did win stand the test of time. That's what I mean about you know, trying to somebody, two people call me about lists and 10 best lists. And can we even make them anymore? How do we make them? And is there such a thing? Are there great film? You know, what is a great film? I and mean, we used to sort of know what it was. And it was a film that stood that stood the test of time. That's why there were so many of the same films on that sight and sound list, because and somebody was said um, 25 years, if it still looks good, then it then it's a great it's one for the ages. But a lot of the films I mean, they look great now, but I mean, I'm Coda, everybody, I love Coda, everybody love Coda, but is anybody going to be watching it 10 years from now? So, you know, it's really, it's sort of interesting. You, you don't know. And, you know, um, I'm a big fan of Barbra Streisand, and I have to tell you, every now and then I need a fix. Uh -huh. I always watch the way we were. Oh, God, yes. Prince of Tides. Yeah. And sometimes I watch What's Up, Doc, when I need a good laugh. But, uh, well, those you know, and standing the test of time. Yeah. I put on What's Up, Doc, when some of my older grandchildren were here, granddaughters were here, and they thought it was hysterical. Did they? Yeah. yeah. So, you, you know, never know what they're going to respond to. That's right. What... Right. And then I had made, I had some watch Titanic. Mm -hmm. and they're like i'm never watching this movie again it's too sad oh really <laughs> they were like 10 i think some of my some of them were like 10 and 12 i'm uh -huh. never watching this movie again it was just so funny that is funny you just you can't know, and, and also if I even mention it they roll roll their eyes <laughs> well because sometimes they'll watch something that's sad and enjoy the sadness of it but sometimes not well, you know, it's interesting. Somebody's just done a, a book about the the way we were. I mean, they're, they're, this is a a new thing now, which I think is great. Doing a one, it's like a biography of a film. You know, yes, a I was book reading it and yeah. about how it got made and all the gossip and the you know the, the the aesthetics of it. So that should be coming out soon. So that'll be something nice for you. The way we were, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, but you know what it is is also those two stars just still are magnetic. You know, and what a great chemistry there was in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had wanted to make a sequel. They actually wrote a sequel. That's right. That's right. Neither one of them had the time to do it. Yeah, well, it goes into that in the Brad... book. I want to see the book as it goes into that. Yeah. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. I would love to see Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston do the sequel. That would work. Because <laughs> he looks an awful lot like Brad Pitt. <laughs> Did anybody see Babylon? No, they don't need to. I was just thinking about Brad Pitt. There was something so crazy about that's another one of these over the top male films. It's just so, you know, so so too muchness of it. But um, Margot Robbie and Brad Pitt, I love them, but they're just so, so wrong. It just they feel so wrong in silent film. First of all, all these stars in silent cinema were so young. You know, they had to be. And and Brad Pitt and Margot Robbie aren't. Did how about um, Everyone Everywhere All at Once? Have you seen that? Oh, no. No, you don't. You're not interested. 
Anybody seen it? I saw it. Yeah. I saw it. And okay. I actually, when I saw it, I had no interest in seeing it. But yeah. other people had said they liked it. So I tried it. And I was so pleasantly surprised. It turned out to be really good. I had the same reaction. I thought I was dreading it. The whole idea of multiverse is just a turnoff. And... <laughs> And it was great. It was really great. And I, I, I thought the acting, I love the, the husband whose name is Kehi Kwan, I thought was absolutely wonderful as the husband. Um, as I say, in this middle and Michelle Yeo. So yeah, I was, that was a big surprise. And Jamie Lee Curtis, I thought that was fantastic. Sort of letting it all hang out, you know? Yeah. So. She's, she was, she's always very funny whenever she tries to, she's always good. She always good. I've never seen her like that though. So I, <laughs> I have a question about voting. Yeah. Um, I know all of us have said it's hard to see some of these movies. Uh, and I've heard that the voting members of the Academy do not have to see all these films. Is that true? Well, that's interesting because they sort of claim to have, I think they do see pretty much everything. Um, they certainly see all the ones that get up I mean, the ones that the, the people have to nominate it. Um, I'm not even sure how it works. I mean, they all vote in the final thing so that the, the, the results will be the, the whole academy. But up to that point, how do things get nominated? I mean, they do. I think what happens is that the the publicists and the studios make sure that they have screenings just nonstop and everybody gets invited to them. So they almost can't avoid, I think, seeing the ones that are important. But I mean, something like that High Leslie one, nobody would have seen that until this, they made this big fuss over it. And so then, of course, everybody had to see it. But that's the trouble. There's so many small films like that that don't get seen that really should be. I think they are the ones that that really get overlooked, some of these independent films. Um, I, I finally got went to see Living, the one with Bill Nye. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I love Bill Nye more than anything, but this is a film, it's an adaptation. Oh, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, it was a Kurosawa <laughs> film called uh, To Live, made in the 50s, and it's the exact recreation of that film in England of the fit and in England London of the 50s of this man who's just this, this sort of robot like civil servant and all of his little group of civil servants and he gets a, diag a, a fatal diagnosis and then he sort of starts living to some extent so nice I thought one of the problems with it is uh, period is a tricky thing <clears throat> and if you if you lean on it too heavily, it just then all you you're thinking all the time about what they're wearing and instead of what's going on. And it was just too heavy on the period. But there was this girl in it, and I haven't rich who I think should have gotten nominated. She's so fantastic. Her name is Amy Lee Wood, and she plays one of the the workers in in this little hive of civil servants. And she leaves to get a job at Lions, and she's just this darling little person with this sort of bouncy personality and she's not beautiful but pretty she has a little bit of a snaggle tooth and she sort of has this lunch with him and she is just so funny she just brings the whole because he's been this door sort of introverted sort of stick and she just sort of is this blossoming creature and I just thought she was wonderful but you know that's a small film and it didn't get a big wide distribution so nobody's really I mean he did get the nomination but I think it's just because he's just such a such a he's so he's had such an illustrious career sometimes that's the real reason it's what you know it's what they've done they're getting honored for their past more than whatever the present movie is can I ask a question about Babylon yeah what, what did what did you think about all of the um the characters uh living in I guess the 1920s whatever there was a lot of cursing and obscenities in the movie what did you think about that what was your reaction was that you know, in Babylon yeah oh yeah I thought you were talking about living I was thinking no I mean that's what was so ridiculous about it it was just so it was just playing the decadent card for all it was worth I mean yeah we know they had there was some depravity and they had drunken parties and Fatty Arbuckle got acquitted, was supposed to have raped this person. But I mean, those things didn't happen all the time. And But the way he portrays it, it's just like one long depraved party and everybody, I mean, it was just, 
I, I don't even understand why what the purpose of that was because it doesn't really. I mean, Peter McDonovich did one. What was it called? The Cat's Meow. Yeah. It was about um, that, that same period. I mean, it was a smaller. It was a smaller story about Hearst and his yacht. About and, Hearst on the yeah, yeah. And, and it really captured. It had this. And it had the gossip. It had Hedda Hopper, and it had the, sort of the same cast of characters. And it was so well done. And it really, you really felt it captured something of that time. Yeah. Whereas Babylon was just this blast of, of you know, obscenity. I mean, yeah. I, and I think he, he was just sort of uh, so so underlining the, the idea of Hollywood is this. Out of this sort of sin of iniquity that it, it, it there wasn't there wasn't any space for any quietness or, or character development or anything else so yeah I think and anybody that has a feeling for some although it has some defenders I'm, I still don't understand how but and I think he's Damien Chazelle I think he's a talented director but I just think he just went so overboard in this and yeah. But do you think it'll win an Oscar or any awards? I don't winner? think so. I don't think I don't think it's even is it even nominated? I don't think it's even nominated. Oh, okay. No, that one got did get overlooked. And I think it was I'm sure he was disappointed, but I don't yeah. think it did very well. Yeah. No. Okay. Thank you. Mm. And are all the directors um who are nominated men this year? Ah uh, no, wait. Are they? I think there's two women. Yeah, there are, but I've all, all of a sudden I've forgotten now. Where is it? Oh, here we go. Madonna, uh, the Daniels, Spielberg, Todd Field. No, all men. Ruben. Oh, that's an interesting one. Did any of you see Triangle of Sadness? You know, you know, one of the interesting things about films now, I look at this, something called IMDb, Internet Movie Database. It's really good if you want any information on a movie, you put in the title or put in an oh, act. IMDb, yeah. Yeah, everything comes up. But one of the things it does, if you have a film like, say, um, Triangle of Sadness, it's a Ruben Austin film, it'll have the voter sc the score of a popular score and then the critic score. And they're so far apart. It used to be they were more or less in line. So it'll be like this one uh, apparently had a much higher popular rating among the populace at large than among critics. Critics were very low on it and the public liked it. And that, that happens often, which is another suggests that we're sort of in a strange place with uh, with not with, with there not being any kind of consensus on movies. I mean, I think that probably is the biggest change that and how can there be they're just um there's just they're just too many i mean the, the sheer volume is just too many so i think the oscar well oscars is trying to find some kind of consensus trying to narrow it down um it's trying to sort of i guess curate it so people will maybe have some titles to go see and, and it's not a bad thing to, to, to use it as a guideline for movies you haven't seen but another thing, if you're not if you're not sure, go on IMDb and then go to the critics reviews and at least you'll get an idea. You'll get yeah. something like RogerEbert.com. He has a lot of good critics writing for him all the times or all these others and get a sense of what it is. I always like to do this because I'm just interested in what critics think about things. I always have been. It's just a, a part of the fun of movies for me is seeing what other people have to say about them. How did Triangle of Sadness get to be nominated as Best Picture? I have no idea. I really would love to know that because I, I haven't seen anyone sort of, you know, beating the drums for it anywhere. Um, it's, I mean, he's done these one. He did the one um, Force Majeure, which was quite good a few years ago. Then one called Square, which is sort of satire of the art world. He's, I think he's Swedish or Danish. This one is all English language. And the beginning is very sharp. It's the, It's sort of the, the, the the celebrity culture and the the elite and sort of making fun of them and this is sort of a power couple she's a fashion model and they start bickering over the check and she was said she would pay and she and it's I thought that was really the best thing in the movie it's a very sharp scene then it's sort of in sections then they go on this cruise and Woody Harrelson is this somewhat funny the unhinged captain of the ship and, and there are all these rich drunken people who are saying stupid things i mean sometimes 
there's a kind of sharp satirical point, but for the most part, it's kind of obvious how how awful the rich are and how out of touch they are. And then the then the chip goes. I'm, I'm, I'm spoiling it. <laughs> If you're gonna so close your ears if you don't know the third section they're on a desert island some of them on a desert island and that's just a whole nother story so it's it sort of doesn't cohere and it's sometimes sharp but it's sort of scattershot i'm just not sure and it didn't get right from the beginning i know it got no here's what happened it did get the best film prize it can that's right that's how it happened and that was a big shock to a lot of people. It got the Palm Door this year, which is the top prize at Cannes, at the Cannes Film Festival. So that, and ever since then, people have been saying, huh? You know, <laughs> but somehow that must have carried it over to the Oscars somehow. Have no, nobody seen it? Okay. No, I think we're blitzed with movies because I mean, I watch, try to watch movies on Netflix and I try to watch movies on Prime and I just found Tubi has some really good movies and lately I can't watch any of the newer movies because they mm. just they just don't ring a bell or resonate. Like a they don't resonate. Well, it's not, and you know, it's not just Netflix and, and Tubi and, and Amazon. Also, there are things like I have one movie and there's one criterion, which I love, which has classics. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, it's fantastic. And so I could spend my life just watching what they've got up there and the things that I haven't seen and they have also wonderful commentary so i'll have a film and then somebody doing a commentary a short one somebody talking over the film so and they're having a hard time making they've had to i'm, I'm sort of close to them because i do essays for them they've had to get rid of some people because they made the money the most of the money they made was off dvds and now people aren't buying dvds that they, they're doing fine with the streaming service but they just can't make that much money and of course they're in competition with all these other streaming services so it's just an embarrassment of riches. Which way do you turn? You know? And, and I, I, I find it. Go ahead. What I was going to ask you is that some of the films that we're, we're calling films were, were produced for streaming. Uh, they were not produced in the last couple of years because of COVID. They were not produced for theatrical release. There was a hiatus, yeah. So, and now they're coming out of that. And as I understand from... Uh, from a family member, the, there's, what, there's a what do you call it, a strike on the horizon, and so the the films for this spring are all just not going to be made. Streaming is pulling back. Feature films are not going to be planned, and so there's going to be a big gap uh, in, of pr product, if that's the word. Mm. Um, and I'm just wondering if streaming has had a, uh, a negative effect on the quality of the films that are co considered for the Oscars or for the Cannes Film Festival, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Some of them are sneaking through. Uh, is that, uh, are, you, are you concerned about that? No, well, I think one of the reasons that these, these directors that have made these kind of uh, huge mammoth kind of films is reacting against the kind of idea of the small, they want something that really is, I mean, this, this this happened in Hollywood in the 50s when suddenly television came in and they suddenly started making all these epics because that was something people couldn't get on television. So this is a kind of, I do think some of these sort of large scale epic films are a reaction to streaming. And I also think some of the smaller ones are because you can still do things on a, on a low budget that I mean, doesn't have to pass through all the filters and and commercial uh, expectations of Netflix and Amazon. So I think a tr tremendous number of different kinds of films are being made. Um, I think Netflix started losing money and I'm not sure why, just because of more competition, I guess, from other streaming services. So so they sort of either raise the price and cut back, but I, I'm, I'm grateful to them. Um, because I, I I love some of these series. I love some of these detective you know series that some, especially the British ones. I'm just hooked on some of those. And mm -hmm. I mean, my, one of my favorite ones was Shetland, and now there's one called um, Slow Horses. I don't know if anybody's seen that, but some of them are just fabulous. And and they're sort of at the end of the day, I'm sort of that's what I'm in the mood for more than a, a big film. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I think the quality is there everywhere. Uh, I think it's just 
the, the rules have changed and the criteria and people are people are making so many different kinds of films. I mean, there's sort of these guys making sort of goofball films that we don't we probably don't even see, you know, kind of nerdy uh, comedy. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. And I mean, there was one that I saw somebody recommended. What is it called? And see, it's a if somebody didn't made it during COVID, and it's a COVID film. It's excerpts of actors. Well, Elaine May is in it, and Sandra oh. Oh is in it. It's really it's oh, what is it called? We're, oh, we're not in the same boat, but in this in the same sea. I think it's something like that. The same sea, and uh, Annette Instrup, who teaches at Columbia Rec, she it was her favorite film of the year, but it got a tiny little review in those in those reviews in the times when they just sort of do a, a couple of paragraphs, you know, after the big reviews and they do these smaller films and a couple of paragraphs. And if it, if it doesn't say critics pick, then you figure you just ignore it, which is too bad because I'm sure a lot of films, you know, this is the trouble. There are all these films, but then there's no criticism to cover it all. The criticism is not, is so diffuse that people aren't reading it. So it's very hard for a smaller film to get attention. And, and this one is, I mean, for me, it was a little wearing because each episode was so powerful. I mean, there was so much, so much sorrow and anger and, and misery and that, but it's still, it was something sort of an experimental film and it had good acting in it and it just went by the wayside and you can't even see it. She had to send me, she had to get permission to get a link from the director so I could see it. So, you know, some of these films get all the attention and then the others that should just get none at all. Molly, uh, I, ah. I, how are you? <laughs> uh, I, I don't envy you having to keep up with all these uh, different films and, and diverse films and so on, but I'm just struck. I'm just curious. You're in, primarily in New York and you're going to film festivals, so you're seeing a lot of films uh, in the theater, but you're also obviously seeing films streaming and so on. And, and I'd just like you to talk a little bit about how you, how you perceive or how you experience films uh, in the theater as opposed to, to mm -hmm. streaming. I mean, you, you mentioned, for instance, All Quiet in the Western Front, you said you saw the first 10 minutes and then I guess you were watching it streaming and then you turned it off. But this is the, you can't do that if you go- I know, the I think more than the quality of the of the, the visual thing, the more than the quality is that that very thing that you're not commit, you don't not committed the way you are in a theater. And right. that's, that's really bad because I did that with everything everywhere all at once. I watched it in parts and I'm, I'm ashamed of myself and don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> the words out now. I wouldn't. I shouldn't even admit it, but I did. And as I say, I really wish I'd seen it when I couldn't. When I was chained in my seat, and I had to see the whole thing because I think it would envelop you in a way. Yeah, yeah. And you're not kind of looking at your watch all the time. Um, the aesthetics, of course, are different, but not always in the way you would think. <clears throat> I mean, for instance. There's nothing about tar that necessarily says big screen, and yet something about it, there's something um, sort of awesome and and ambiguous about it in a way that, and and her uh, that character that Kate Blanchett plays, the the conductor, is such a larger than life figure. She's made herself into this larger than life figure. I mean, that's what to me is so fascinating. There's a scene right in the beginning <clears throat> where she's getting dressed in a tuxedo to go on, and she's strapping her breast down it's like she's suppressing every feminine a aspect to her personality she's just she's created herself and of course eventually she has to sort of come apart but there's a kind of grandeur even this chilly grandeur and I'm glad I saw that in a theater I would like to I saw the bill this is interesting that you know the Lincoln plot the great Lincoln Plaza as I said uh, it was ended uh, two years ago, they've now the same on the West Side, all the people that miss it so much, they've started this thing called um, Lincoln Palette something, Lincoln Palette, something Lincoln Theater. It's in a school, this big building off of Columbus Avenue, and it, you go up two flights. It's like a screening room, but they, that's where I saw Living, and they're showing this Irish film. <clears throat> the, incidentally, <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the Irish, the woman who was interested in the Irish, 
this should be interesting. It's called The Quiet Girl, and it's from adapted from a book. Yeah, that's, I know. Yeah, I okay. Heard about so, that. Yeah, and it's partly in Gaelic too. It's, it's so it's yeah. Anyway, they're showing that at this little teeny theater on the west side, and they're all trying to get money to subsidize it. So there's a little outpost now of art film over there. But seeing it, it was almost like seeing it on television because the screen, you know, screening room screen is not that big as a as opposed to say the screen in the AMC theater. Uh, there's also a piece in the in the time on the New York Magazine about the terrible state of projection in some of these theaters. Of course, critics see them in screening rooms and the the absolute the prime quality, but some of these theaters are not doing the, a, jo a good job in projecting. So, and of course, it's just so easy to do it at home. We just can't, you know, the convenience of it is just, it's just, what can you do? So I just have to make an effort. I did go over, they're having this thing called the Rendezvous, the French of Rendezvous. They have a series of French films coming out. And I did go see one over at the, at the, at the, at the screening room over there. And I, I love, I love going over there. I love going to the Walter Reed Theater. Um, and, you know, we did that all during COVID, the, the film festival last year where everybody went and wore masks. So, I mean, there has been theater going. And I think I was talking to David Schwartz was a programmer at the Paris Theater. Netflix, as you probably know, took over the Paris Theater, which had been this great you know, sort of haven of, of, of European cinema all these years. And they took it over and they were doing a great job. And he was showing first, Netflix would open one of its, films or something as a prestige opening at the Paris Theater, but they were also doing retrospectives, which was great. So that's another thing we don't have anymore in New York. We don't have retrospective showings. And he was doing that. He's left now, but it seems like they still have that same policy because they'll have somebody's going to come, a critic's going to come in. I went and did one about a Godard film, V for Savi. Somebody's doing Fast Times at Ridgemont High. So they're trying to blend the old and the new which I think is, is wonderful, but you know, how many theaters like that are there? They're just, they're just disappearing. So um, I guess we're sort of, we, we go when we can. Um, remember the West Hampton Theater? Remember that? I live yes, near there. Right. <laughs> it's still there. It's still there, but not showing anything. I mean, it, it wasn't the best conditions there either, but at least they showed stuff. Sag um, Harbor has done a fabulous job. That's wonderful. Wouldn't it be great if we could do something like that in West Hampton? But you, yeah, that's yeah. a lot of money, I think. Is anything happening in the Southampton Theater? I, I'm not out there, but I, I know of it. I don't know. Did somebody I buy it? I've been Theater a lot because I'm in Riverhead. I don't know if you guys have been out here, but I'm in Riverhead and we don't have a theater between Mattatuck and Holbrook. Hmm. You have to go mm -hmm. to Stony Brook. Or Holbrook. Yeah. There's the no Mattatuck, theaters in Riverhead anywhere. And the Mattatech Theater doesn't show movies anymore. Well, yeah. Oh, well, they did last year. They don't anymore. It was converted to an axe throwing and all kinds of. They have one or two theaters, but they don't show uh, current movies. Oh. Really? Wow. Yeah. Well, we haven't gone in like a year and a half because of COVID. Yep. No, so, they were, it's been converted to a more of a multi. I think there's one in Hampton Bays. I think there's a movie in Hampton Bays. There is. And yes. there's also a small theater in Greenport, small theater, which hasn't right. reopened yet. Hopefully it will. We're doing. Oh, I think it's open because I've seen cars in the parking lot, people coming out. Because I work in the library and I'm, I go past there. The library, uh, is, open. The library is showing uh, classic films on Fridays, the Montauk Library. Oh, oh really? that's nice. That's yeah. nice. I'm doing an Italian film festival this month. I did a, a 30s romantic comedy for the month of February, Valentine's ish. And um, January, I did some Disney animation films. In the fall, I did uh, a lot of film noir, Hitchcock, ah. and uh, Orson. Yeah. Mm. We, we probably have to be careful because there's some restrictions, which I wasn't aware of. I'm starting to get worried that. Something came out of the blue where, you know, you're not supposed to do this, you're not supposed to do that because these are films and we're com supposedly competing with with indoor films. I mean, with movie theaters, which don't exist. Uh, oh, I that's mean, ridiculous. The closest really? Theaters we months. show movies in Hampton Bays too. We show one a month. I know, but you know, you got to be there's a license. Oh, I'll have to tell them. I don't know if they know. I know. I, 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 don't tell. It's 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 a it's a headache. But these older films, I'm like, you know, come on, we're 20 miles from East Hampton. 
first run films uh, and then based uh, Sag Harbor might show some older films. We're not competing with anybody. Yeah, I we, we should take up, if we could take a page from the new Plaza Cinema, the one I was just telling you about yeah. and have one sort of centrally located, I don't know where, Hampton Bays or someplace. Wouldn't it just be great to have one that shows first run and also retrospectives and just a little theater? Can we do that? Uh, yeah, my hometown, Pelham, New York, has a, uh, a art. There's three, uh, two or three art house films, film theaters that they uh, restored and reestablished mm. as nonprofits. Yeah. So they can do both. Uh, they're mm. like Sag Harbor Theater. Like, uh -huh. But you know, they, they pay for that privilege of the libraries. Mm. You know, we, we're trying to give it away. And uh, yeah. anyway, anybody who wants to come to Montauk Fridays, we're going to do this film series. <laughs> You're uh, more than welcome. You doing film noir? We did some. We're going to do some. that already. East Hampton is going to have a, a Who Done It festival in, All right. in April. So I'm going to do some more. Uh, oh, what what sounds like that, some, some stuff going on? Yeah. yeah. We do our best. It's a small, mm. small place, small community. Yeah. Quad Library has a uh, monthly series that they do and the Froy Arts Center in West Hampton as a series it's it's intermittent but what is they that have, they they for uh, especially in the summer they have a, a good series of, of films that they put on and uh that you can go to what which where is that Ernie? the performing arts center oh yeah, yeah 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 right right yeah, it's, it's, oh right. that's right the series that Andrew yeah, was yeah, the yeah. Series. right I forgot about that yeah right all right so on that on that passive note <laughs> enjoy the oscars um i guess it's sort of time to say good night um got any predictions anybody wants to make probably hopefully michelle you i what? think Jamie lee curtis may have a good chance a lot of people really enjoyed that film yeah. I haven't seen it, but... and what do you think it's going to be kate blanchett or michelle yeo for the best actress uh -huh. Hmm. No, no. Tar was great. Tar was amazing. Did you like Tar? I, oh, I yeah. like it too. Some people hate it. Though. I love it when a film is that divisive. When people mm -hmm. get really get heated about it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you see the it, Ernie? The subject. The whole Ernie? subject matter yeah, no. is great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. All right, that's a good note to end on. So, so it's not so dismal, and there's a lot to look forward to. And I really enjoyed talking to you all. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. Bye. Well, I get off you now. <laughs>